Hi, my name is Scott Haley. I'm with Kentucky Office of Rural Health. I want to thank everyone for coming back out for the second part of our webinar series, um, Building Morale and Motivation Within Your Crew. Um, before we start today, I want to remind everybody that tomorrow we will be back at the same time, 12 o'clock, uh, with Dr. Jay Fitch. Uh, he's going to be speaking on um, improving our EMS organization teamwork, morale, and culture. Um, today, uh, I want to introduce Mike Tiegman, and he is going to be speaking on finding your way to feeling motivated, cutting through the stress. Uh, so we'll go ahead and turn this over the mic and let him get started. Good morning. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I had a, a really good time listening to Chris yesterday, and I know that uh, uh, Jay is going to rock it tomorrow. I always learn a lot from, uh, from both of those folks. Um, <clears throat> just kind of kind of dive in. I want to I want to give you a little bit of a backstory on on what kind of kind of got me interested in this whole concept of stress and and resilience and, and its relationship to to motivation enough to 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 write a book and do stuff. I uh, way way back um, and a long time ago um, in the early '80s, I worked as a paramedic uh, for the city and county of Denver, and my partner and I had just shown up at uh, Denver General Hospital and dropped a dropped a patient off. And we got one of those calls that you, uh, you hate to get as a medic uh, for a police officer had been shot at number 40 South Pennsylvania. Now, the, this is a, a daytime shot of the house. It was uh, evening when the call came in. And what had happened was a woman inside this house had called 911 and she said she, she was afraid her drunk husband uh, might kill her. Um, and in, in front of the house, there was uh, this sign was posted. Uh, this house has been harassed by the Astro Hole Division of the Denver Police Department for 20 years, and <clears throat> there was an upside down American flag hanging in the front yard, which is, uh, uh, those of you who've got a military background know that's an international symbol of distress. Um, so they, uh, they dispatched a, a patrol car, and in the patrol car were uh, two officers. One was a rookie officer, uh, James Weir, um, and the way the Denver Police Department did their training back then is they would... Um, bring into the academy for a month. And then uh, you'd spent two weeks uh, out in the street with the field training officer, uh, learning about the reality of working the street as a police officer, and then bring you back into the academy for the last four months worth of your training. So Officer Weir was in that two week period, uh, right at the very beginning of his uh, training, he hadn't been a, a police officer uh, for even two months yet. And <clears throat> he and his uh, partner, who was a field training officer, they uh, pulled up uh, down the street here uh, in front of the house. And um, they uh, looked, up at the, looked up at the house just, as, just after the sun had set and noticed behind the screen door, there was a man with a long barreled weapon. Uh, so they got on a radio and said, we got a man with gun. And Officer Weir uh, uh, bailed out of the patrol car and took up a position of cover uh, behind this uh, four foot tall concrete wall that was in front of the house. The house had a little bit of a high ground position, a little bit up on a hill. <coughs> His uh, partner uh, took up a position to cover behind a, a couple of parked cars that were on the opposite side of the street. And the guy in the house started shooting at the officers. So I uh, got on the radio and shots fired and they're exchanging uh, gunfire back and forth um, with the assailant inside the house. And officer Weir uh, looked up over the top of this concrete uh, wall to return fire and took a, a shotgun blast to the forehead and was dropped on the ground uh, in between the wall and the sidewalk. So the call went out, um, police officers from all over the city are uh, responding as you can imagine. Uh, my partner and I were only uh, four blocks away so we uh, took up a position of cover uh, behind a four foot tall um, apartment complex uh, that was just down the street. And <clears throat> Uh, officers are, uh, are arriving on scene. Uh, one of my uh, one of my uh, colleagues, um, Sergeant uh, Sampson, a um, uh, friend of mine, uh, pulled up and he was at the opposite end of the street, parked his car uh, ways away down here, and is uh, was making his way um, up toward the uh, up toward the house, trying to get to the downed officer. Um, we were doing the quick peek um, out behind the uh, the edge of the apartment complex. Uh, just as uh, Sergeant Sampson uh, got to Officer Weir, uh, he took a 12-gauge shotgun blast to the chest, 
did not have his soft body armor on that night and has dropped on the ground uh, next to Officer Weir. Um, so you can imagine the, the energy in the air. I noticed that some of the officers who were showing up were pretty wild-eyed um, with a pretty panicked energy, kind of tremulous tremulous hands and, and, and trying to figure out quickly what to do. Uh, some of the officers were cool and calm and we're going to dial in and, and take care of this. Um, and at this, at this point in time, somebody got on the police radio and said, Hey, all the, all the, uh, street lights and the lights on, uh, people's, uh, porches, they're backlighting us and they're making us easier, easier, easier targets. So, um, every, uh, officer on the scene immediately started shooting out all of the, all of the street lights and the lights on the front porches of, uh, of people's houses uh, to make the, the neighborhood a bit darker. Um, Denver Fire Department uh, showed up at, uh, at this point in time with a pumper um, along with the Denver SWAT team. And um, we, uh, we kind of uh, hatched, a, hatched a plan. I worked with the um, uh, SWAT team commander and uh, we uh, would kind of hooked up a, a plan and got the uh, fire captain to go along with us. Uh, we put a ballistic shield uh, from the SWAT team in the driver's window of the pumper. And um, myself, my partner, two EMTs from the fire department and the SWAT team uh, stayed on the, on the side of the pumper away from the gunfire and uh, uh, slowly made our, our way down the street um, near where the officers were. Uh, the SWAT team commander said, we will uh, give you uh, 30 seconds uh, worth of nonstop automatic weapons fire into the house uh, so that you can uh, have time to extract uh, the downed officers. So they did the uh, five, four, three, two, one, go count, uh, lit up their weapons. We went in uh, parallel uh, to the gunfire, uh, grabbed the two officers and drug them behind the pumper uh, and uh, back the pumper back down uh, behind the apartment complex. Uh, to which a, another ambulance had arrived, and we each took one of the officers to the uh, trauma center at Denver General Hospital. Uh, Officer Weir um, was not able to survive his, his injuries. He was uh, cardiac arrest, and we picked him up and remained that way and died. Um, Sergeant Sampson was awake when we, uh, we, we extricated him, um, uh, but not, uh, not doing well from the vital sign perspective. Uh, he cardiac arrested just as we moved him over to the trauma bed at Denver General. Um, they opened his chest and were able to do a quick repair of his heart, uh, defibrillate him and got him going enough to go off to the operating room. He managed to survive the entire process uh, well enough to be able to return to his feet and continued uh, working for another uh, four years before his retirement. He uh, now runs a little antique shop in a small mountain town in Colorado. And so, you know, after, after this situation, this is back in the 1980s, um, they brought in, you know, all the, all the psychologists, Jeff Mitchell, uh, the guy who created critical incident stress management flew in from, uh, Baltimore. And, uh, you know, we had all these, all these sessions with, uh, psychologists and counselors and the whole, uh, debriefing process that many of you have been through. And, um, uh, one of the things I just, I, I was aware of is that, you know, it was certainly upsetting to me and I was, uh, sad for the loss of the officer and sad for my friend. And I, I took the rest of the shift off after the, after the shooting, I had another four hours of work to do and, and didn't work the rest of my four hours. But, uh, um, I, you know, I, I was able to, you know, be sad, but recover and get back to work. Uh, other people, it took them, you know, a month or two to, to get, get back to work. And there were two of the officers that showed up on the scene that were so severely uh, traumatized that they were never able to come back to work. So I, I got to, you know, just got curious about what's the difference between, People who show up in a circumstance like that kind of in a panic and kind of stay in a panic uh, versus people who are able to be calm and cool and collected in a, in a crazy situation. And, and what's the difference between those of us who saw, smelled, you know, felt, heard the same things as other people and, and those of us that did okay versus those of us who uh, ended up uh, with severe psychological and, and emotional injuries. And the difference really is, is resilience and um, and the ability to manage your stress in the moment. So I want to just kind of orient you to how this how this process works. So in the in the road of life, when you're driving along, um, resilience is that um, building of uh, strength and, and capacity so that you can handle stressful situations when they come up. 
Um, just like kind of going to the gym to, to build your muscles so you don't hurt your back. Stress management are the tools that you use in the moment to dial down your sympathetic nervous system response so that you can be cooler, calmer, and more effective. And then if you end up with a, a psychological or emotional injury, <clears throat> all of the trauma-informed uh, psychotherapy and counseling and peer support and all that stuff is kind of on the other end. So what we're going to focus on today is just the stress management piece. Um, so I want to ask you a quick question. What, uh, what causes you stress? Um, what causes you stress? And, and, uh, and I'd love for this to be a little bit interactive. Um, so if you can uh, uh, go up to the, to the top of your screen and hit the more uh, deal and open up the chat function. Uh, there's a chat function there that should uh, allow you to type in. So I would love uh, for you to, to log on to that and, and come along with me as we, uh, as we do this. So what, what kinds of things cause you uh, stress today? Is it, uh, is it the <coughs> COVID-19 that's a, it's an issue? And, you know, I know that, that for me, um, the things that's, that stressed me out six months ago were different than things that caused me stress today. Um, it, uh, you know, Six six months ago, if uh, I was in the grocery store and somebody sneezed, wouldn't even register on my radar screen. Um, but I was in the in the grocery store a, a couple of weeks ago, and there was a woman with a surgical mask on who was doing, uh, getting getting ready to sleeve uh, sneeze, and she pulled her mask down to sneeze into the open air all over the organic Honeycrisp apples, and then put her mask back up, and and that you know that certainly certainly caused a reaction among. Uh, everybody, uh, everybody around us. So this coronavirus has has added new things and and issues. And when they have done research to look at people who um, are are doing healthcare work and taking care of patients uh, who are exposed to coronavirus, this is one of the first studies that was done. They found that uh, over half of them uh, had some depression. Uh, close to half were suffering anxiety. Uh, a third of them were having problems sleeping, and uh, two thirds of them had experienced. Uh, a little bit of distress. Um, so I, I see the, the answers here. We got uh, circumstances people can't control, being overwhelmed, unplanned schooling, uh, politics overall. Michael, I'm not surprised that one is yours. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of, uh, couple of questions here and just type your answers into the, into the chat here. So uh, do you find yourself getting upset by little things these days? Is that yes or no? Or, or you find yourself kind of overreacting uh, to situations that normally you wouldn't uh, wouldn't react to or are you finding yourself impatient with delays like traffic and or or noticing that your your palms are a little sweatier when um, you're not really doing anything anything physical or you know does it sometimes take you longer to calm down uh, after something upsets me you know and it's just those are just kind of ways to kind of self-assess what you're what your stress level is like these days. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when I, I see all the images in the newspaper and Facebook of, of uh, people in their, in their PPE, you know, one of, the, one of the first images that flashes up to me uh, is that of soldiers in, in combat protective gear uh, going into uh, to a, to an actual conflict. And, and um, I know that uh, uh, for, um, uh, some people, I've, I've got a lot of friends who've, uh, who've been in the service. Uh, some of them are, are kind of offended by the analogy that this is, uh, this is like a war. And others of them say, this is, this is exactly like going into to, to combat. And so I'm, I mean, absolutely no disrespect uh, to those of you who have uh, served in the, in the military. I have ut utmost respect for you. And I, and I think it's, it's worthwhile to kind of learn uh, some of the stress management techniques from uh, from you and uh, and your uh, and your colleagues, um, and the the framework that um, is used to prepare soldiers uh, to go into battle, uh, to take care of themselves while they're in an actual battle, and uh, to take care of themselves afterwards, um, is this framework called uh, Battle Mind. It was developed by a team of of psychologists out of uh, uh, Walter Reed, and um, they, uh, you know, they say that, uh, you know, people need to understand the nature of combat. It, it is intense and, and life-threatening, and that certainly seems to resonate with what people are going through dealing with, uh, with COVID here. Uh, fear is common and expected, um, and it impacts everybody psychologically and emotionally, whether you want it to or not. 
Um, it certainly has a strain on your on your families. I uh, I was talking with one of the medics that used to work with me in uh, in Oakland, and she's got a six year old daughter. And uh, Danielle was getting ready for for work and packing her uh, her second uniform and heading to work in her uh, civilian clothes. And her daughter said, "Mommy, why are you you know why are you taking a second uniform? What's going on?" And and her mom said, you know, well, sometimes the uniform gets dirty at work and I like to have a clean one right there to, to change into. And, and her uh, daughter got really uh, kind of watery eyes and, and said, mommy, please don't bring the coronavirus home to me. And um, Danielle, who's, whose wife is an emergency department nurse um, at San Francisco General, you know, is like, you know, they've got two kids, um, both parents in very high risk um, occupations. And even though They've, you know, shielded their kids from the news and all that kind of stuff. Even their six-year-old um, is aware of it. And, and this um, poses moral and ethical challenges. And, you know, I know a lot of places are uh, changing their approach to managing uh, cardiac arrest and, and resuscitation. Um, certainly in the, in the critical care system when uh, places are overwhelmed, you know, uh, and, and you've only got so many ventilators with more patients than the need. Um, it, it puts people in some pretty uh, difficult ethical situations. So the, the objectives of the, the training in Battle Mind are to uh, give people strength to be able to face the fear and do the work they need to do anyhow. Uh, the skills to be able to dial down their emotions in the moment, which gives you more access to the parts of your brain that allow you to think, perform well, and make good decisions, and to recover faster um, when you've had a kind of an emotional hit, um, build resilience and strength, and also to be able to lead effectively. Um, so, you know, these are these are strategies that kind of go on the belief that everybody is a is a leader in this realm, and certainly um, everybody who is uh, is uh, running calls and taking care of patients, even if you're not a supervisor or a boss, you are absolutely leading families and first responders and and other folks through um, situations. So, leadership skills matter from this perspective. Um, and one of the things I always think is important is to, to remember that none of the things I'm telling you here are my invention. I, I am a, a translator of the work of a whole lot of really smart folks. Um, and if you're, uh, if you're interested in uh, uh, websites or books or resources uh, for many of this stuff, you know, uh, you're, every, everybody will have access to my email. I'm happy to send you anything you want as far as more information. Um, but as we, uh, as we dive into some real skills for how to manage your stress in the moment, um, I want you to, to think back for a second and uh, type into the chat, who was who it that taught you to drive? Um, who, when you learned to drive, the first time you learned to drive, who taught you how to drive? Um, so there you go, my dad, uh, dad, okay. Uh, for me, it was the neighbor lady across the street, your father on a tractor, Scott. I like that. Um, um, for me, it was the neighbor lady across the street um, who, because my parents were too nervous to be able to uh, uh, be in a car with me alone. Um, so the, uh, <coughs> the act of remembering uh, to be able to answer this question um, is, is what's referred to as explicit memory from a neuroscience perspective. So this is uh, pulling up uh, something that you know happened in the past, um, and and it is uh, it lives in the hippocampus in your brain. Um, but those of you who've driven in the last year, I used to say in the last week, but some of you have got work from home uh, office jobs now, um, where you may not have driven your car for a while. But uh, but those of you who've driven in the, this year, um, when you get in and drive your car, um, it is memory that allows you to drive. It's memory that allows you to use the brake and the accelerator and to use the steering wheel and not hit anything else, um, to use, uh, use turn signals. And I think, I think in Kentucky, people actually use turn signals. In California, they seem to be optional. Um, but all of those kind of skills of driving and getting from one place to another without hurting yourself or anybody else, um, it's memory that allows you to do that. But you don't experience that as, now I have to remember how to start my car. You just get in and start your car. Uh, it's like tying your shoes or brushing your teeth or drying off after the shower. Those, it's memory that allows you to do all of those things, but you don't experience that as memory you pulled up from the past. You just know how to do it. You just know how to tie your shoes. You just know how to brush your teeth. Um, that's implicit memory, and it lives in the 
in the anterior cingulate cortex and the prefrontal lobes of your neocortex. And um, stress management skills, in order for them to be effective, they really need to be overlearned to the point where they are implicit memory. So they're automatic. Um, because if you have to remember now, what was that technique I learned in that seminar uh, back, uh, back during EMS week and that thing that Tegman or Chris or, or Jay shared with me, if you have to pull that up from your memory, it's not going to be accessible to you when you're stressed in the moment. Um, your cognitive capacity is state dependent. Um, so if you're relaxed and cool, you got access to a lot of things. Uh, if you're stressed, you've got access to less. Um, so out of the things I'm going to share with you, I want you to I want you to remember like one or two things uh, to try for yourself. Um, and just as a, as a framework, I want to want to walk you through um, the, a little bit of the neuroscience of stress. Some of you have seen this before, but a quick review never hurts. Uh, so this is your uh, brainstem on PowerPoint on a Zoom WebEx over your computer. Um, those of you who are old enough will get the uh, reference to that joke. But this is uh, uh, responsible for regulating your temperature, encouraging you to take a breath now and then. Uh, regulating your heartbeat, basically it differentiates you from a head of cabbage. Next part of the brain to evolve is the limbic system. The limbic system is the seat of all your emotions. So happiness, joy, excitement, fear, anger, frustration, um, all that live in the, in the limbic system. The next part of the brain to evolve is the neocortex. This is the thinking uh, part of your brain, that outer edge. And from the perspective of stress and the stress response, um, we're particularly focused on the prefrontal lobes of the neocortex. Uh, prefrontal lobes of the neocortex are also known as the executive center, uh, sometimes described as the smart brain. Whatever you are thinking of um, or aware of on your, on your brain right now is happening in the prefrontal lobes of your neocortex. Um, this is also the first part of the brain um, that, uh, that gets impacted when you consume alcoholic beverages. Um, and, since, uh, and since coronavirus, depending on which data you see, uh, uh, alcohol sales in this country have... Uh, have gone up uh, 55 to 70 percent uh, across the country, and uh, and it's it's it's, in, it's interesting that uh, liquor stores are considered an essential service in most communities. <clears throat> but uh, the impact of alcohol uh, reduces your impulse control, so you're more likely to say or do things that later you'll be embarrassed about if you've had a little bit uh, a little bit to imbibe with. Uh, next part of the brain is the thalamus. It's like the 911 communication center for your brain. It takes in information from your eyes and your ears and all your senses and proprioception and distributes them to different parts of your brain for uh, analysis and possible action. And right next uh, to the thalamus are two little pieces of almond shaped tissue called the amygdala. And the amygdala is your body's lifeguard. It's, it's like your century. It is on guard uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and it is constantly scanning every sight, sound, smell in your environment. And it is asking three questions of everything it interacts with. It is asking, can I mate with it? Is this something I can eat? Or is this something that is going to eat me? And if the answer to can I mate with it is yes, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which is mediated by the vagus nerve, the longest nerve in your body. And it kicks in what is known as the relaxation response and inspires the emotions of love and joy and happiness and, uh, and, uh, and connection. Um, and then on the other hand, if the answer to the question, is it gonna eat me is yes, it kicks off the old fight, flight. Um, most, most people only learn to the fight or flight part of the response, but you can also freeze or there is a fainting component. So there's four possible uh, responses to the sympathetic nervous system activation. And, and in reality, we need to balance both. Um, you can't be all parasympathetic or else you'd just be a uh, relaxed, happy couch potato doing nothing, um, except for maybe mating. Mating goes along with uh, parasympathetic, but that's for another talk. Um, uh, and you couldn't be in, in, in sympathetic nervous system fight or flight all the time because you'd burn yourself out. Um, so it's, it's really a balance. And there are uh, different people have different levels of uh, ease of activation of their sympathetic nervous system. Uh, some are just, can be just cool in any circumstance and be able to be chill no matter what they're faced with. Um, others have a, like a hair trigger response where they, uh, they will jump at the, at the sound of a, uh, a leaf falling outside. And, and all of us as mammals 
have um, have this system. It's part of what keeps us alive. Um, so you know, it allows us to to recognize danger in the environment. And this is this is true of all mammals, but but humans have a a, a remarkably big brain, and we can think of things um, and get stressed about things that um, aren't aren't necessarily even real in the environment. We have the ability to imagine dangers. We have the ability to focus on dangers long after that danger is passed. Um, and it's this kind of chronic ongoing stress or the loops we create um, in our brain that is the problematic stress that we're dealing with. And whether you, uh, whether you call it vicarious trauma or compassion fatigue or burnout, I mean, these are all kind of the same wine in a different bottle. They're all manifestations of chronic unmanaged threat stress. <clears throat> And, it, and, and this has significant impact on your body. Um, so it is the root of inflammation. And inflammation causes damage to your uh, cells, causes oxidative stress, uh, decreases the ability of your mitochondria, the little battery pack and powerhouse in your cells uh, to produce energy effectively. Um, within your uh, cells, we all have uh, DNA. And uh, some of you may not have recognized this is a picture of your DNA. And, uh, and at the end of your strands of DNA are these little end caps that are called telomeres. And telomeres, um, it turns out, are uh, very involved in the aging process and in the, in the disease process. And the, uh, my colleagues at uh, UCSF, where I teach uh, grad school, have done tons of, tons of pioneering research in, uh, in telomeres. And uh, uh, Alessia Espo is probably the leader uh, in this uh, in this research uh, realm, uh, he, she describes um, telomeres as kind of like the end caps on your shoelaces. And when you're born, they're pretty long, and as you age, they get shorter and shorter and shorter. And when they get short enough that they fray, um, it is the setup for cancer, uh, in inflammatory diseases, and all the problems associated with that. And as the root of aging. And since Telomeres were discovered around 35 years ago or so. They've been doing some really interesting research. And, and they have found that there are different things that you can do in your daily life that will shorten your telomeres and therefore age you faster and increase your risk for a whole bunch of diseases. And there are things that you can do that lengthen your telomeres and uh, increase your lifespan and decrease your likelihood of getting a serious disease. Um, so chronic threat stress um, and, and not, not dealing with that, not managing that shortens your telomeres. Uh, smoking, uh, no matter what it is you're smoking, uh, decreases the, the length of your telomeres. Uh, eating processed foods with high added sugar. And there's a whole long list of other things that all shorten your telomeres, basically all the, all the stuff your parents told you not to do. Um, on the other hand, uh, that old advice of eating uh, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, lengthens your telomeres. When you get deep and restful sleep, it lengthens your telomeres. Spending time in nature um, lengthens your telomeres. One of my, one of my favorite studies, they uh, uh, took a group of people who were at a conference in San Jose, California, and um, they, uh, there's like uh, 500 people at this conference, and they went in and drew everybody's blood, um, and there's a blood-based test that allows you to measure the length of telomeres. And then they used a randomized number generator, and they uh, divided the group into half, and sent half of them out to a park um, behind the conference center with box lunches for their lunch period. And there was a koi pond out there and there's a, a rose garden and it was kind of butterfly season. So there was a lot of monarch butterflies there and a beautiful sunny day and trees and grass. And, and people went out sometimes alone, sometimes in groups and enjoyed their lunch out in nature while everybody else stayed in the conference center and ate their lunch at their conference tables like most of us have done thousands of times at thousands of conferences. They brought everybody back in and redrew everybody's blood. And the people who had spent just an hour in nature had measurably lengthened their telomeres as compared to those people who stayed inside for lunch. Pretty, uh, pretty powerful stuff. Uh, another, uh, another aspect that has uh, been shown to really lengthen your telomeres is um, mindfulness. Um, so whether that is uh, you know, meditation, contemplative practices, prayer, whatever it happens to be for you, um, those, those, that kind of getting, getting quiet and uh, exploring the, the nature of your own mind or your relationship with a higher power or however that works for you um, lengthens your telomeres. And this, this combination of 
you know, things that reduce your telomeres, things that cause an inflammation, things that cause uh, oxidative stress, these are the roots of high blood pressure. They're the essence of obesity. They're primary causes of diabetes. They are the primary contributors uh, to cardiac disease, to strokes, to all different kinds of cancer, to over 100 different types of autoimmune diseases. And they also, from an emotional psychological perspective, they contribute to depression, anxiety, burnout, compassion fatigue, post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic stress injury, whichever one you like to say. And they're the roots of, of suicide and suicidal thoughts and suicidal actions. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you on this call know that those of us in, in emergency services have higher rates of PTSD, compassion fatigue, uh, and suicidal behavior than the general public, public by a factor of you know, more than 300%, um, depending on which, which study you read, it's, it is, it's massive. So the question is, so what do you do? What do you do? And what do we do in order to manage and, and decrease our stress? And, and, and you've got choices. And one of the things that is cool about stress management is you have the power to choose. And you can choose to just continue to suffer. Um, you, you may end up with a, cr a crippling uh, physical or, or, or psychological or emotional situation for yourself, but that's a choice you get to make. Um, you, can, you can choose the maladaptive responses to stress, which is you know, probably uh, responsible for the increased, increased alcohol sales. Um, one of the things I noticed as coronavirus kicked up is uh, a significant increase in um, people on, on my Facebook feed who were taking early retirement. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm in a situation where I can uh, pull the plug early. I got my finances in order enough and I, I don't need to expose myself or my family to this anymore. I'm going to go ahead and pull the plug. And that, you know, that is a legitimate choice if you're able to do that. Uh, most of us are not. Um, another thing that, uh, that some people do when it comes to a stressful situation, hard to do with coronavirus, um, is trying to change the source of the stress. And, uh, and this, this typically happens in relationships, right? People will get fall in love and, and, uh, and get married. And uh, I just, I saw a day before yesterday that a couple of uh, AMR uh, employees uh, got, got married in New York on deployment, um, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but when you, uh, when you get married under the hope that your spouse is gonna change from how they actually are, um, that's, a, that's a setup for a challenge. So um, instead, uh, the choice that, that I think makes most sense is to, to work on changing your brain. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll play, with a, play with a few things around this. Um, and again, as I go through this, you know, I encourage you to look for one or two things to play with. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I, uh, I learned about recently, and this, uh, this comes from Dr. Bruce Perry, who's an MD, PhD in, uh, in Houston, Texas, and is uh, one of the world's leading experts on stress, particularly as it affects children. And uh, we were on a, a, a WebEx, and, uh, and one of the things he mentioned was, he said, you know, before you're born, um, you are not hungry, you're not thirsty, you're in a warm, a moist environment, and um, you are constantly soothed by both the vibration and the sound of your mother's heartbeat. And um, so if you, if you are looking, and that's like, you know, that was like kind of the ultimate pre-stress state for most of us. Um, you know, maybe not true if your, your mother was a substance user or something like that. But for most of us, um, that was kind of like our first calm, peaceful, unstressed state in our life. And he said, you know, you can, you can kind of recreate that um, on your own if you want. You know, draw a warm bath and dim the lights uh, a little bit. And uh, you put on a soundtrack uh, of music um, that is uh, at uh, uh, 60 to 80 beats per minute. Um, and if you're uh, interested, I've got my own playlist um, that has got some of my, uh, my favorite songs um, with, uh, with a beat like that. Um, and you can dramatically reduce your stress in the moment. It's, it's huge. Um, another, another strategy um, for... Um, dealing with stress is, is referred to as uh, labeling your emotions. And um, my, my most recent experience with this, my uh, um, son, Axe, who's eight, um, was eating um, 
uh, penne with marinara sauce in the living room. And he likes a lot of marinara sauce on his pasta uh, while he was watching TV, which I know is bad parenting, but we do it a fair amount anyhow. And he was um, bringing his uh, half eaten dish back into the kitchen. And uh, my wife, Sasha, uh, was, was standing uh, standing there as he was bringing it back in and he tripped on one of his mini Legos. And I watched her facial expression as this spray of marinara sauce kind of started to launch um, out of his bowl. And, and, and my, my wife really likes um, white furniture. So we have white sofas, we have white club chairs, we have a white kitchen table, we have white paint on the walls. Um, our floor is painted white. So um, you can imagine this spray of red marinara sauce going across um, uh, the, the white stuff that she's got there. And, and her, I saw her initial facial expression, um, you know, was like, Ugh. and but she, she took a quick breath and, and she said to herself, what am, I, what am I actually feeling right now? Because we've been working on the stress management stuff together a lot. And she was like, what am I actually feeling? And she said, but I'm, I'm actually feeling surprised. Um, I'm feeling surprised. And, and Morgan said on here, screen time rules are suspended during quarantine. And that is absolutely true in our house. Um, and she said, I'm feeling surprised. And she looked at our son. She said, Axe, I'm feeling surprised. Are you feeling surprised? And he looks up and goes, Mom, I'm, I'm really surprised that surprise is the word that's coming out of your mouth right now. Um, and, and, and she said, well, let's just get to cleaning this up. And without that pause to label the emotion in the moment, um, this would have been an upset little kid and uh, an upset mom and um, a, a whole lot of emotional drama that didn't need to happen. Um, so that, that labeling your emotions helps you take a little bit of a pause, just a little bit of a pause before you actually react. And it is a way to dial down your sympathetic nervous system response. And, and I also encourage you to, you know, regularly during the day, just take, go for a 90 second pause. So if you're, a, if you're a coffee drinker or a tea drinker and you make yourself uh, a cup of coffee, you know, put your phone down, don't look at your screen, um, you know, whatever, whatever that is, don't look at the TV, just, Enjoy your cup of coffee for a moment. Take it, smell it, smell the aroma of the coffee. Focus on the taste, focus on the warmth that it feels as it goes down, down your system and just check into the cup of coffee for a minute and check out of the, the stressful things in life. And another, another strategy is to schedule a five minute worry session during the day. Um, and I know this sounds crazy because we're trying to like decrease worrying and stress. But there's something about patch, packaging um, the stress um, and, and worry into, into tight little bundles that dramatically decreases its, its impact on you. So, um, and, I, and I encourage you to actually schedule it. Put it into the calendar on your phone or your work calendar or however you keep track of things and make it daily. And, and when it's time to worry, set a timer. And, you know, whether it's five minutes or if you need 10 minutes or whatever time that is, um, during that time, just don't try to control your worry. Just let the worry rip and just let it absolutely, uh, you know, just take over. Don't, don't hold anything back. Just worry, 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 worry. And then when the timer goes off, stop and distract yourself. Look at, look away, look at something else, do something that takes your mind away from it because you're done. And then throughout the course of your day, when a worry comes up, you can go, oh, now's not my time to worry. I've got a worry session scheduled for tomorrow, and I can remember it. And some, some people, they keep a little worry pad where they jot a note down for themselves. Okay, I, I need to worry about this when it comes to my time to worry. Other people trust that if it's something they really need to worry about, they'll actually remember it uh, during their session. And, and there's something about compressing uh, the worry in your life that liberates it from the rest of your day and your time that helps. Um, another huge stress management practice um, is uh, the practice of gratitude. And um, we're all washing our hands uh, a lot these days. Um, it's disturbing to me that some people have discovered hand washing for the first time in their lives. 
um, as a result of corona pra- practice or coronavirus, however that is for you. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the practices to sing the happy birthday song while you wash your hands so that you get the full 20 seconds you need for, uh, for a good uh, scrubbing and including getting underneath your fingernails and whatnot. Um, but one of the practices I've started is when I'm washing my hands, um, I, I think of two things that I'm grateful for. And I try to think of different things every time I wash my hands. So the first one is I, I try to think of something that I'm grateful to myself for. And there's something really relaxing and powerful about the practice of self-gratitude. So, you know, uh, you know, grateful that I've taken on the grocery shopping for uh, myself and my uh, mother-in-law um, because I, I have a theory that I can uh, practice um, uh, virus-free, more sterilized shopping uh, than any of the other members of my family because I've, you know, been in environments where I've had to do that more than other people. Um, and I can do it without touching my face and with keeping a mask on and those kinds of things. Um, and then the other one is I, in my other hand, I think of something I'm grateful for, for, for somebody else. So, um, when I was actually washing my hands before coming into this session, the first thought that I I showed up for is I'm grateful, uh, to the, the folks here in Kentucky, the, the rural team and the, and the, the rest of the state team for inviting me, uh, to share some time with you and, um, really grateful for their uh, their really deep commitment uh, to take care of the emotional and, and psychological health of all of you who are taking care of patients uh, in the in the state of Kentucky. That's a that's a big deal. And I you know I just for me I was I was really uh, grateful to you all for for that process. And I and I hope everybody who's listening in right now uh, feels a, a similar. A uh, sense of gratitude for uh, the folks on your on your leadership team here, and you know as part of that gratitude, I encourage you to to you know go ahead and if you can spend a little bit of time in nature. You know if you've got a dog, your dog needs to walk, um, and taking the time to do that. Um, there's something in these in our busy lives about you know if you're a, a morning shower and you usually shower in ten minutes go ahead and take a 15 minute shower and spend the last five minutes just really indulging yourself in your shower. And, and as, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, Morgan said, screen time rules are suspended during quarantine. You know, if, if you want to uh, check out and, and watch some tube for a little bit, that's actually a healthy strategy uh, for distracting yourself. Now I would not encourage you to put on the news when you sit down, you know, watch, watch game of Thrones or something. Uh, not the news because the news will will fire it back up. Uh, if you're a video gamer, you know everybody's always got all these concerns about about video games. But I'll tell you what, um, when you're uh, when you're in a in a constant ongoing stressful circumstance like COVID, um, this is a great strategy. And for me, um, I, a book is a hugely powerful thing. Um, it's my break from screen time, and and I like books that are paper books. And, and I like something, you know, that is, you know, not uh, necessarily work related or, or, or any of that kind of stuff as a way to um, kind of check out for a moment and, and get away from the stress. Good thing to think about. Another, uh, another strategy is the uh, can I, will I uh, decision tree. And when, you're, when you've got something you're worried about, something you're stressed about, um, at, you know, kind of asking the question, is this something I can change? And if it is something I can change, will I change it? And if the answer is I can change it and I'm willing to change it, then just change it, okay? If it is something that you can't change or you're not willing to change, just let it go. If if you can't change it, you're not willing to change it, worrying about it does nothing but cause you oxidative stress and shorten your telomeres. It provides you no other benefit. So make a balloon out of it and just imagine it floating away with the helium up and out, out, of, out of sight, out of mind, away from you. Good strategy. Uh, most of you have seen images like this um, where you've got a, a, an animal, a uh, gazelle in this case, being chased by a big hungry cat. And both of these animals are having full-on acute stress responses. Um, the gazelle is having what's referred to as a threat stress response, increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, constriction of the peripheral vessels, 
uh, focus on blood flow to the major muscle groups uh, and a full on focus of getting away uh, from this or else, or else it's gonna end up dead, right? The cat is having what's referred to as a challenge stress response and a challenge stress response looks very similar. Increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, peripheral vascular constriction, uh, focus on blood flow to the large muscle groups so that it, and uh, tunnel visioning so it can focus on getting dinner, right? And, and even though these are both part of the sympathetic nervous system response, and they both kind of feel similar physiologically in your body, um, when they go on for a while, they're experienced very differently. Um, so the, the threat stress response is that one that if goes going on continuously, that's the one that causes all the downsides to stress we've been talking about. The challenge stress response, on the other hand, um, actually nurtures your resilience. Uh, challenge stress response actually lengthens your telomeres. Um, it, it, it improves and nurtures your performance. So if you can catch that feeling of fear and in your brain, turn it around to excitement, um, it is one of the most powerful stress management strategies that you can have in your repertoire. Um, the psychological phrase for this is called cognitive reappraisal. Um, this is one of my favorite studies that was done on it is collaboration between Harvard University and my uh, colleagues at UCSF. And what they did is they took a bunch of young people and uh, they're going to put them in what is considered one of the most stressful experiences, which is having to give a public presentation. And um, if you look at those lists of what are the most stressful things in life, uh, death, uh, uh, fear of death uh, ranks uh, number one or number two between public speaking and, you know, going broke and, you know, having your daughter have a, a teen pregnancy and all that kind of stuff are way down low. Um, but public speaking and death are right at the top of, of fear related things. Um, so they uh, took this group of young people and they used a random number generator and they divided them into three groups. They had a control group, um, which they gave no instruction to, except for you're going to have to do this presentation. Uh, the second group was the ignore group. And they said, look, you know, when you give this presentation, you're going to feel a little bit stressed. We want you to ignore the signs of stress. And the third group, they taught cognitive reappraisal, which is like, hey, when you think about doing a presentation, you'll notice your heart's beating fast and, and your palms are a little bit sweaty. That's your body telling you that you're excited. And when you channel that excitement into really connecting with your audience, um, it will improve your performance and you'll do better. And uh, they measured all three of these folks um, before, during, and after uh, giving their presentation. They me uh, measured total uh, peripheral resistance and cardiac output in liters per minute, and found that those that had the, uh, the cognitive reappraisal training um, had a 300% lower uh, sympathetic uh, nervous system stress response as compared to the control group. So the way this, uh, the way this works, is you have a situation uh, that activates um, the uh, physiologic arousal of your stress response. And our brains tend to pretty quickly go into this negative assessment about, oh my God, I'm, is my zipper gonna be open? Are they not gonna like me? Is nobody gonna laugh at my joke? Am I gonna forget my lines? What if my note cards get mixed up? You know, all these, all these things. And that, that sets up a, a, a negative physiologic response that includes all of the inflammation and oxidative stress that makes you hypervigilant uh, for potential threats and, and screw-ups in the environment, and it, it damages your performance. With cognitive reappraisal, you still feel that, whoa, something's happening here, but rather than doing the negative assessment, you go, hey, let's, let's reappraise this. Let's think of this differently, and uh, think of this as excitement. Um, this is something that's going to drive my performance. Um, this is going to allow me to connect better with my audience, uh, so it gives you a nurturing physiologic response, reduces your search for threats, and actually facilitates and improves your performance. So if you can get in the habit of catching uh, that fear or that stress and turning it into excitement um, and, doing that, uh, and doing that as a habit, um, it can give you a, a huge edge on stress management. One of the other uh, things that is, is really helpful uh, when it comes to stress management is uh, understanding that you have the ability to trick your nervous system. And your nervous system is, you know, your brain, your spine, your, all your, your peripheral nerves. And, and you can trick it into a parasympathetic nervous system response. So 
Um, this, uh, this little acronym, GRACE, uh, comes from the uh, martial arts teacher and uh, author, uh, George Leonard, who's one of the co-founders of the Esalen Institute and, uh, and uh, a, a big figure in the human potential movement in the 60s and 70s. Um, and uh, the, the first, uh, and, and actually, you can practice this with me if you want, just create a little bit of a stressed body. Um, so you can kind of scrunch your uh, scrunch your face up there a little bit and uh, um, uh, tighten your tighten your fists and clench your jaw a little bit and and feel what it's what it's like to feel a uh, feel a stress body and um, and then just kind of let that go a little bit and the G for ground um, is where you use your toes and you use your toes like you were had your uh, feet on a rug and you were using your toes to pull the rug and bunch it up underneath your feet. So if you've got shoes on or barefoot or whatever, just try it right now and use your toes and pull them back. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I taught this in a, in a webinar a few weeks ago, and afterwards I got an email uh, from an, an F-16 fighter pilot um, who uh, said um, when he was getting ready to fly his first uh, bombing mission over Iraq um, back, in the, back in the 90s, <clears throat> um, he, uh, just as they were about ready to close the, the hatch on his cockpit, uh, his flight commander, uh, said, okay, I want you to remember one thing. And he was thinking, you know, his bombing coordinates or, you know, thrust or whatever. And, and his, his commander said, wiggle your toes. And he looked at him and was like, what wiggle my toes? And his commander said, it will keep you calmer and keep your head in the game and keep you on target. It'll improve your performance. Wiggle your toes. And, uh, and last week, I did a, a stress management workshop for a, a group of uh, uh, the world's leading OB OBGYN physicians uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. They have a big reproductive uh, medicine practice, and I had all of their uh, faculty members on a call. And I mentioned this, uh, this toe thing, and they said, you know, we, uh, we tell our patients uh, when we're getting ready to do procedures that they're nervous about or uncomfortable, uh, wiggle your toes throughout the whole thing, and it dramatically decreases our patient's stress. This is a strategy you can use. The R in grace stands for relax. And, it's, you know, just trying, telling somebody to relax almost never works. Um, but we all carry our stress in different parts of our body. I tend to carry it in my neck and my shoulders. So wherever you carry stress, if you're a shoulder or neck carrier or in your belly or in your jaw or whatever, just consciously relax that one part of your body where you hold stress. And, and most of us actually hold stress in our jaw. So just allowing your jaw to fall open. You don't have your cameras on right now. Nobody will see you. So just try it and let your jaw fall open. Usually that causes a little bit of a cascade of relaxation down your body. The A in grace stands for aware. And, and this is knowing your own system enough to be aware of your own stress response. And notice what things are signals for you uh, that you're being a little bit stressed out. And for me, my first sign that I'm getting stressed is my peripheral vision gets a little bit fuzzy. And when you kind of notice it, if you can use one of these other techniques and, you know, wiggle your toes or take a deep breath or whatever it is, the second you're aware of your stress, it helps. Uh, the C stands for centering. And uh, this has to do with the, the anatomic center of your body, which is just about uh, two inches beneath your, your belly button, your umbilicus there. And uh, what I want you to do, join with me and just take a, take a finger, uh, whether you're right-handed or left-handed, I don't care which, and just poke it into your belly um, there uh, a couple inches beneath your belly button. And, uh, and hopefully there aren't any HR folks. I have just asked the entire state of Kentucky to touch themselves simultaneously together on a Zoom. And a, uh, but it's, it's for a good cause. It's reasonable. Um, and, and so while you've got your belly, your finger poked into your belly, what I want you to do is take a deep belly breath and use your breath to push your finger out of your belly and just use that to bring, push your finger out of your belly. That is a centering practice used uh, frequently in the martial arts and the military, um, that will uh, help you, uh, decrease your stress response and give you uh, better cognitive performance. And the last E is for energize. And energizing is about that sense of uh, warming up your fingers and your toes. Um, and you know how, how relaxing it is to get into a hot bath. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting when your boss stresses you out saying, excuse me, I need to go take a bath. Although if you can do that, great. Um, but the reason baths are so relaxing is that 
the warmth causes peripheral vasodilatation, which is the opposite of the constriction of a stress response. Um, so what I encourage you to do is just rub your hands together and warm up your hands. Just that act of warming up your hands uh, activates your parasympathetic nervous system. All right. Um, if you're interested in it, I encourage you to experience uh, some form of, of meditation or contemplation. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, back I've been meditating daily since I was 14, and and back when I first learned to do it, it was you know, uh, hippies and yogis were the only people who were doing it. But uh, but uh, meditation has been adapted by uh, many uh, law enforcement agencies, and uh, and virtually all branches of the U.S. military have uh, have have focused on it. Um, and if you don't want to learn the full meditative practice, um, you can do the chocolate meditation, which is where you just get a nice piece of dark chocolate and smell it because chocolate has 426 pheromones in it. It's one of the, the more complex smells. And then take a bite of good quality chocolate will melt uh, just about two degrees lower than your body temperature and just really pay attention to letting it melt in your mouth rather than woofing down the entire Snickers bar, okay? Um, and the, the, the thing I wanna to end on is to just mention uh, from, a, from a leadership perspective, um, our, our limbic system, we usually think of it as kind of being uh, in the head because that's the way it's drawn, but there's really an open loop nature of the limbic system. It's what allows parents uh, to calm uh, stressed out kids and it's also what allows leaders to have an impact on other folks. And it's sometimes referred to as the interpersonal limbic system. Um, research shows that you can actually alter the hormone levels, the cardiovascular function, sleep rhythm, and immune function of other people just with your presence. Um, so any of you have been in a group or a meeting where one person yawns and a whole group of other people yawn, um, you know how quickly that's contagious, that emotional contagion. Uh, when you're a leader, um, if you're um, somebody who uh, uh, goes up and down with your emotions all over the place, uh, it's like being in the front car of a roller coaster and everybody on your team gets to ride along with your crazy emotional vicissitude. So as a leader, practicing these stress management techniques so that you convey a sense of calm and clear thinking for your folks is critical. And, and as a leader, it's important to make sure that you connect with your folks um, during, uh, during this coronavirus, make sure that your folks are um, fed, uh, hydrated, and that they have adequate PPE and make sure everybody's included. So these, these strategies I've shared with you today, uh, they're not gonna take your stress from high to low. Um, it, it doesn't work that way. But we can take it from high to moderate, um, which, is, which is helpful. Um, and um, when, you, uh, <coughs> when you're uh, we didn't talk at all about the trauma-informed therapy. Um, your state has got great resources uh, for emotional and psychological support. Um, if you're uh, looking for, for something else, there's an organization called the All Clear Foundation. I uh, just put All Clear Foundation into the, uh, 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 your web search information, and you'll pull up one of the richest group of resources you could possibly imagine. And with that, we are right at the, uh, at the end of our time together with 60 seconds to spare. Uh, any, uh, any questions or uh, uh, anything else from anybody before we, uh, we bring this uh, high-speed, low-drag session to a close? We've got some nice. Thank you, everybody. And we'll turn it back to our host here. All right. We want to give uh, Mike a big thank you. Uh, we also want to give a, a shout-out to a couple of people, uh, K-Beams, for providing the the web webinar platform for this and also first watch for also helping make this uh, webinar possible. Um, don't forget to come back tomorrow, same time, 12 o'clock noon um, for our last and final um, series to this uh, with Dr. Jay Fitch. So if you have any questions or comments, you're more than welcome to email me. Uh, if not, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, call this an end. Thank you all for coming out today.